Okay, so we are, we're, we're started this campaign, and I know some of you guys, let me just preface this too. We are starting, um, it's not a campaign, it's, it's, a, it's a giving thing, okay, that we are doing. If you are new here, this is not for you, <laughs> um, unless you feel like God's speaking to you out of heaven. But um, as many of you guys know, we come out of an Assemblies of God background and a vineyard background, but then we were independent. So that means that we do not have like a corporate um, pot to dip into for, you know, like some churches, they're a part of a denominational, you know, thing, organization, and there's a corporate pot that they get to help supplement their income. We are strictly tithe driven, and I don't know if you've looked at the cars, our cars that we drive outside, but nobody, you know, we're not trying to do this so that Pastor Josh gets his own private jet. <laughs> Um, we simply, the, you know, just are trying to actually teach from a place of sowing into the kingdom of God, okay? That's, that's the angle that we're going for. Um, if you put your mark, uh, okay, so I'm trying to do this thing where I'm reading through the Bible. It was supposed to be in three months, but I'm just, I'm still in the, I just finished Leviticus, so it's probably going to be the whole year. But how many of you guys have read Leviticus? Anybody? It's a real page turner, right? I mean, you're just like, oh my gosh, another sacrifice. What? Another burnt offering. But the idea in Leviticus is, you know, as God is trying to set up the nation of Israel, right? He's called them out of Egypt, and he's like, I'm setting you up. You are going to be a set-apart people, okay? And that means that you are going to do things way different than all the other people, your, how you spend your efforts, your energies, your cattle that you raise, what you plant in the ground, that's all for me. That is different. You're not sacrificing to pagan gods. You're not storing up. And there's nothing against, um, I'm not saying that there's anything against like generational wealth. Some of you guys are really good with money, right? I am not. <laughs> um, but all of Leviticus, God is trying to set Israel up as being distinct. He's trying to sanctify them, okay? And he's like, you are set apart from all the other nations because this is how you handle your wealth. All right. So this is what we are trying to do in this new series is to paint a biblical picture of this. We are not trying to manipulate anybody or twist anybody, um, but the fact of the matter is that as nice as it would be, um, how many of you guys saw Monsters, Inc.? <laughs> right? Okay, back in the day, um, when, you know, they, they generate the whole monster uh, realm with, um, from scaring little kids, right, that gets stored up in the tanks. I wish that's how it worked in this world, where we just prayed super hard, we bottle it up, and then we can send that to pay for our electric bill <laughs> or the watering bill. But the fact of the matter is we are part of this earthly kingdom, and finances, money is what pays the electric bill and everything. Anyways, um, so that's why we're kind of embarking on this and just um, trying to get everybody to, it's not a giving campaign because it's an investment. We are, we are the church. And when we get into this in a second, um, we are going to look how the church is able to change a culture, change economy. Okay, change the way, get, go into places where there's a stronghold and break those strongholds in the name of Jesus. Okay, first though, before we do that, we are going to watch a video. Um, we, we figured, yeah, we could get up here and preach to you guys, but wouldn't it be awesome to actually hear from people in the church who've actually done this? They've done the tithing thing, right? They've put, they've put God's mark on their finances and said, this goes to you, God. So we are going to watch a video by the Alan Aces, which I just have to say, like, they, major kudos, like, this is a big deal for them to step out and publicly share like this. So I want us all just to kind of put our thinking caps on and listen to what they have to say in this video. All right, let's kill the lights and roll the video. I'll scoot over here. So what was going through my mind was, oh, man, I get paid once a month, <laughs> and now I'm writing a check for the entire tithe, 10%. I'm 
like, okay, I, I can't do this by myself, God. Mm -hmm. You you really need to come through and you know manage how we live on a monthly basis. As a child, I was brought up in in tithing, and um, it was it was common for my parents to tithe, and all of our family, everybody. It wasn't real taboo to talk about. It was just something that we did. Um, I think as I progressed into being my own adult, um, Eric and I were just talking about this. I kind of turned into the subscriber dad, really, where I checked out of tithing and just hit the button and it was on auto and you know it was a thing handling itself you know netflix check granite creek check you know and um it wasn't until we started really spending last year going through systematically everything in our house and kind of fixing our house till we got to tithing around december and um it was really a word um that god was speaking into my life which was being active and um, you know being a steward the first word that I saw was being active and how can I be active if it's on autopilot you know and um, so I really kind of took hold of how we tithe and I make sure it's the first check that's written we still write checks they're digital but we still write checks <laughs> and it's the first check and um, we're capturing all of the income and in addition to that, we started um, a systematic offering as well, f specifically in naming things that we're looking for in our in our life. Mm -hmm. And it's completely changed who we are from a financial standpoint. When I was, you know, that little girl that would go to church and I went with my aunt and she would, my parents would always encourage me to go every Sunday and then they would give me a dollar and there's here. So I always thought of it as an offering, like not as a tithe, but I knew that I was giving to God. And then once we get older and we're into like, you know, regular service, then that the tithing thing and the 10%. So that was always ingrained in me. And I know as, um, you know, once we were married and it was always very important to me, like, you know, we're, we're doing the 10 and he'd be like, I got it, Erica, I got it, you know? So um, I kind of always was just took the back seat, but I was that encourage her like you're doing it right and I okay like and so and I would we would get the statements and stuff but um, I always knew that you know you were gonna give that to God and then when we did the financial piece with Dave Ramsey you know um, courses then I was like gosh I'm not we're not teaching our kids this like they see us and they they do it but we haven't actually like told them like this is what you should do too so it was like you know you have to um, give to God and then you save and then you can spend. So we, mm -hmm. we started to, I started to instill that with the kids too, because I just know that it's a biblical concept that we want to follow. And um, not that you're always like, oh, God's going to bless you and favor you, but it's, it's, a, we want that mark on our finances. Um, and when I was younger, I just wanted to show God, I love you. I'm giving you this. This is my gift to you as, you know, my little dollar. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that basket always meant something to me that got passed around. Prior to 2022 or 2023, excuse me, um, I got paid weekly and, you know, 52 times a year versus 12 times a year. It really changes how you maneuver. And there were some weeks I'm telling Erica, hey, you know, um, we got to be at budget with our groceries this week. You know, we've got to be at budget with this. And um, but always I think I, we, I came to Erica like in the middle of December and said of 2022. 2023 excuse me and said um hey look i i really want to i want to start presenting an offering to god and you know it's it's going to be a deliberate action mm -hmm. that we're going to do and um it's in addition to our normal tithe um and this is what you know kind of how we're going to structure our finances is doing that and um we started doing that January and then it was like, here we are into February. So I've got, you know, uh, I, I wrote a, uh, the initial check, but then I started noticing some things. Well, that isn't the only income I got. And so you get a little 50 bucks here, you get a hundred bucks here. And how long did I go without noticing that? 
Mm-hmm. And then you look at, okay, well, I probably missed a lot. Yeah. And then I was just, you know, kind of repentive at that point is because being the subscriber dad, you know, it just, you think you got it all covered mm-hmm. and it's like, okay, well, her income or my income changed and well, the tithe never changed, you know, right. or, you know, all that. And it's very easy to just kind of be passive. And, um, you know, going back to that statement I said about being active, that's like the first word in being a good steward is being active. And um, I wasn't for a long time. I was just very passive. And now everything is with intention. And, um, you know, it's it's with the right heart. We're, I'm thankful that, um, you know, I have the ability to um, make that my first priority. My eyes are filled with a little bit of tears right now because it's just... Uh... I feel like God is really working and or has been working in him and to um, just do what is right and do what, you know, the word says and be a good steward. And he's, you know, becoming a really good example for his children to do the same. And now through this, you know, right. um, he wasn't even supposed to be at that leadership meeting. And I was like, I'm going to be there. And I was like, just just hang out with me. And then he's like, he rose his hand and I was like, who is this guy to say something? So I'm usually the quiet one in the back, man. <laughs> yeah. I don't like a lot of talking. You know? yeah. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, it was, it's been just because um, that's all my prayers are, is that we just do this together. And um, that, you know, I know the wonderful man that God created is is just now just starting to come out. And and I just it just really is overwhelming as a wife, you know, so yeah. that's from speaking from his wife. But. As a, you know, someone who serves the Lord too, it's just like, yeah, I, I want, I want to do what's right. And, um, I don't even know if right's the right word, but that's just what feels, it's biblical, you mm-hmm. know? And I just, when he was speaking, it brought to remembrance of when, you know, house markets were crashing and, you know, he got, um, he, you know, had been let off of work and was on disability and didn't work for what, a year? And we were okay. Mm-hmm. And he even in his state at that time when he wasn't the, the Chris that he is today, he was like, it's because I've tithed, Erica. We've tithed. We've always given our first to God. And, like, we were okay. Everyone else had to ration and, you know, and we were okay. And, you know, did we have elaborate lives? No, but we were fed. Our roof, we didn't lose our house. It was still over, you know, the roof was over our head. And, you know, our kids were okay. And, and we just, we walked in a and a blessed favored life. And he, I remember him telling me it's because I never stopped tithing and we've got, we got carried through that really tough time where everyone else, it was a struggle, you know? I think overall, you know, I have a, uh, an excitement, you know, I think, um, and Erica can attest to this. It's, it's so, so I have, as we went through that identity, you know, study on what's your identity, um, my identity was in work for a long time, mm. you know, and I was a workaholic amongst other things. And I put work first for a very long time. And that was one of the things that, you know, I, I we cleaned up. And so I've been looking for a new identity and my identity in Christ is looking at my actions and tithing is like, okay, we've, you're finally taking care of all your stuff, right? You know, you're finally, you know, putting your focus on what's important to me, you know, to, to God and to our family. I'm excited that he's excited. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but we talked earlier about peace and I just feel like that, like a, a word hope just came, you know, um, about almost a year ago. And I was, I didn't realize what hope was, um, what form it was coming in. And so this is all just, you know, little bits of that hope that God is showing us and the peace that comes with that. And, you know, we all just want peace. That's, that was my, my thing. So, yeah, I want to walk in it and I want to share it. And I want to, you know, this part of it is just showing like God is faithful. God has never let us down because we've been faithful in that one thing that he says, test me on. And we've been faithful on that. Now, were we doing it to exactly the way that it says in the Bible? Probably not. I was really passive, you know. Um, But when you're looking for a breakthrough, dig deep into really the the fine points on how you're supposed to live and how you're supposed to do something. Mm -hmm. And the answer is there. 
you know, and really turning full circle on tithing is, uh, has been miraculous for for our family mm. you know uh, in a month's time we the, the amount of income we've generated i mean it sounds like oh get rich quick no, yeah. it's, not, it's not that <laughs> it's just security mm. you know it's security and peace um that that comes with that and knowing that okay well you know god we're you and i are, we're finally on the same team with money i would just say answer that tug everyone gets a tug and you know what yours is and just answer it. Don't ignore it. And, um, you know, it's, we're just, we're just Chris and Erica who have been faithful in that. And like you said, you're cleaning house and doing it the right way. And, um, even God even takes the wrong ways, you know, <laughs> and he's taking care of us and we're very, um, grateful for that faithfulness over us. But yeah, when Josh said that there's, this isn't like a vision thing. And I know I felt really strongly about like, this is a vision, like you are, helping a vision. And the vision is that, um, you know, for your own homes, for your own marriage, for your own families, um, and then for our church, like, you know, there, we've needed the church. Everyone needs the church. The people that don't know they need the church, it's here and they're going to come here. For me, I, I, I just want to say that um, Erica and I wouldn't be here if it weren't for all of you who tithe mm -hmm. and for the church and, um, so we thank you that you are sowing into this church because I promise you we wouldn't be here mm. if we weren't. And thank you from our family to yours. Mm. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
we move into this house, we, and then we decide, you know what, we just want to probably, because th- we had flood damage in the house, and it was the whole house, so it was a lot. So we're like, why don't we just try and fix it up and sell it? And, um, and we've always felt like God has wanted us to sleep in the city where we minister to, right, which is Claremont. And um, you guys all know the house prices in Claremont, right? And so... Anyway, so this was, we just kept praying about this for years. And anyway, so we're in this rental house, and we really love it. It's in Ontario. It's a couple, couple streets up from where our original house was. So we're like, well, we've lived here for about a year and a half, right? When we do the escrow inspection, there's probably not going to be any surprises because we've lived here for, for a, a amount of time, right? And so they do the inspection, and it turns out we have to get all the electrical. It had old knob and tube wiring in the attic that was still active and live. And what they had done was they'd put the air conditioning ducting on top of that. <laughs> so they were like, no, you, the, you know, the, the, when they did the inspection, they're like, you're going to have to redo everything. And it, we have to rip out the wiring. And we were just like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> And then the roof inspection, when they're inspecting the roof, it was a two-door style house that had five layers on it of roofing. And so we got, we, we probably went through four, we did four different estimates because we're like, maybe the first guy is trying to rip us off. But it was going to be at least 80000 because there were five layers and it was so steep. And we're like, okay, between that and the electrical, we could... We, we can't do that. We don't have that kind of money laying around, even though we had sold our house, um, our, our old house. And so anyways, so we, we fell out of escrow. We dropped out. And um, time's going on. And what we didn't realize were the sellers had a cash offer waiting in the wings. So when we said we were dropping out, they're like, no problem. And so they ended up taking the cash offer and they were like, you have two weeks to, to move. And this is after COVID hit. And then I got COVID really bad and was not functional. <laughs> and so we we're like, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? So anyway, so we had all this money sitting in the bank. We're like, we'll just get an apartment or something to rent right now. That's fine. Do you guys remember some of you guys, we put applications in everywhere. And because of COVID, we didn't want to move in with my, my dad and stepmom or, or Larry and Janice, because we were like, what if we get sick again and give it to them, right? So we were like, okay, we'll just find some place to rent. And some of you guys were super awesome because you would go around to the places that we had put an application in and pray over the place. Well, time, we, we got an extension on moving out for two weeks, and um, we were just searching everywhere. We were looking everywhere for a place to rent. We weren't being picky. And we couldn't find anything. And time came for us to move out. And we do not have a place to live. So we talked to Mandy and Michael. Michael, This is when Michael was still the youth pastor. Um, and Mandy was on board as well as the youth pastor. And we're like, we have something awkward to ask, but we need to move into the youth room. <laughs> because we were like, we don't have a place to live. Right, and so they were trying. We're like, we can move our stuff in here and put some of our stuff in in the yard. And so, I don't know why we didn't think about this before, but we're like, we could buy a trailer with some of the money. So we bought a trailer. We did not move into the youth room, but we put a trailer down on the property here, and we rented. You know, because we went from uh, almost like a, I think it was a almost a three thousand square foot home in Ontario to living in this tiny trailer that was maybe five hundred square feet, maybe. That was with a bird, two cats, <laughs> and um, so we put all of our stuff in storage. And um, I was like, surely something is gonna pop up, right? Some. We're still. We are. We are honestly at the time we were feeling like God had forgotten about us. We were feeling destitute. And um, what was super awesome was when we were cleaning out the black tanks. If you don't know what that is, you can ask somebody later. And uh, inevitably, somebody would drive on the property when we were at, Pastor Josh, we... Can you guys just pray for us right now? And we're like, literally, we have our hands full of, with crap. So no, we cannot right now. It was a very humbling season. 
very humbling. And we actually, my, my stepmom was like, you know what, you might as well just sell all your stuff in storage because you're paying for storage of all your stuff. You don't know when you're going to get a place. You can always buy new furniture. So I remember going to the storage place, and I just started taking pictures of stuff and posting it. And I just crumpled in front of one of the storage units, and I just thought, how did we, how did we get here? What happened? Did we not, did, you know, did, did we displease God in some way? What happened? What happened? And I was just brokenhearted, and I just wept. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure the, you know, all the cameras that they had, that somebody was in the office, the rental office there, the storage was like, oh my gosh, this lady's having a breakdown. I was, I was just sobbing. And, um, and I just remember feeling like, God, you for, forsake us. But what we did was, we, we still, we continued to tithe. We're like, we don't understand what's going on right now. We don't understand why we're living in this trailer. Nothing against trailers at all, but it's just a little tough when you have two cats and a bird, and, and the Wi-Fi wasn't great out there. And um, so we just were like, God, we are going to continue to honor you. We feel like you've abandoned us, but we're going to still give and be faithful. And I'm not doing this to be like, okay. It was just, we were like, we don't know what else to do, so we're going to, we're going to keep doing this. Well, so we were like, okay, the plus is we're saving a lot of money living <laughs> in this trailer, right? And so we were like, okay, we're going to hunker down for like a year, maybe a year and a half, and just we'll just, you know, save a ton of money. And so it was a huge adjustment, but we got there. We figured out stuff. Some, uh, the noises helped us set up like a cat cage for our cats so they could at least go outside in the cages because there were coyotes that would come on the property at night. We didn't want the cats to get eaten. And so we were like, okay, we kind of made, we homesteaded this place. It feels a little cozy. Well, about, I think it was two weeks, three, three weeks into us living in the, the trailer, we had somebody approach us, and they're like, hey, I have a friend of a friend in the neighborhood. They're an older couple. He's a retired doctor and his wife, and they're totally set financially, and they just, they, I've already bought a new place in Claremont, those small little community things, right, and, and uh, like townhomes, and they just want to travel. They've booked their entire year out, actually, just to travel. All they want to do is just travel. They're retired. Their kids are set. They have this great house that they want to sell, but they, one of the stipulations, they want to, they don't want it to go to an investor. They want it to go to a nice family, and so I was thinking about you guys, and so we're like, well, we'll go look at the house. So we went to go look at the house, and it's beautiful, gorgeous neighborhood, and we're like, there's no way we can afford this house. Thank you for the offer, but that's a hard pass. We can't afford it. And so this couple was like, well, what were you going to pay for the house that you dropped out of escrow on? And you guys can, you know, look it up if you want. I'm not going to say it from up here, but so we told them, and they're like, great, we'll give it to you for $50,000 less. Yeah. And so we were like, what is going on? And so they were like, we have a cruise to catch. We're going to hook you up, connect you with our escrow people. Uh, we don't even need an agent. And on top of it, if you guys want to just go ahead and move in before we close escrow, that's fine. Because all of our stuff's moved out. We're in the new place. We got a boat to catch. And we were like, what is going on? So I... To you know, just to make sure, I, w I showed the contract to my stepmom, who is uh, uh, she's a hairdresser, great hairdresser, but she also keeps her real estate license active. So I had her look at it, and she's like, "You're getting screwed over somehow." And I said, "I I know that's what it seems like, but look at the contract." So she looked it over, went over it with a fine tooth comb, and she was like, "I." I don't understand this. They're actually getting screwed over because they're selling it to you for so cheap. I said, I know, right? Right? And so that's what happened. You guys, God gave us this amazing house that we could not, yes. Like I said, I am not trying to be like, you know, but we tried to honor God through that pain and that... <laughs> We're pumping out our own poop <laughs> into the sewer line. 
Like, there's nothing more humbling, let me tell you. And God is so faithful. I have a billion stories like that. Now, you guys know we've walked, we've walked through stuff too, right? It's not always, you know, poops and giggles when you serve Jesus, right? Like, there's going to be dark times. But I think what we saw with Erica and Chris in the video, it, it, I think finances can show the state of our heart. What do we spend money on? You remember uh, Pastor Josh last week did a video of the, showed the video of that guy that sold his house to get Super Bowl tickets, right? <laughs> do you guys remember that? Like, well, okay. Okay, so recently, you guys know I, um, some of you maybe didn't recognize me because I have two shoes on instead of a cast, right? Um, and so uh, what's come about is my doctor's like, you know, your foot is healed, but you're going to have to switch up the shoes that you wear. You cannot wear shoes like this anymore. And so I went back and I started going through all my shoes. I'm not going to tell you how many pairs of shoes I have, but you want to you want to talk about where your heart is, there your treasure is also. I have a lot of shoes. And there's nothing wrong. I think God gives us a fashion sense, you know, to express ourselves. But it hit me, I was like, man, it hit me hard. You know when you have those aha moments and you're like, oh, snap, and it just zings you, right? Well, I definitely felt very zinged. And I was like, I have a lot of shoes to get rid of. This is, this is, this is what I spend a lot of my money on. And I think God is so gentle with us, though, when he's convicting us and telling us to change up our heart where we're investing in, because God is not like a, an Italian grandmother that guilts you <laughs> into to eating more food, right? God doesn't have to use guilt. It's out of an abundance of our heart that we're like, God, I love you so much, and I honor you so much. I, everything that I have is yours. If you want me to give this or give this up, I will do that. Absolutely, Jesus. And that's that's the posture of this new giving thing that we're trying to do. You cannot outgive God. Guys, I, so recently, so we were driving one car, which was my car, right? Because I couldn't drive for four months. That was hell. That was horrible. Like, if you want to test a marriage, just have your spouse drive you all over the place for four months. Like, um, so I, I, I finally got the okay to wear shoes again, and then I got the okay to drive. So, Josh, we need to have two cars, right? Because we just, you know, you got a teenager that's doing all the things in high school and needs to go everywhere, right? And then Josh works a second job, so he's going all over doing weddings. And so he went to go start his car up, and it didn't work. And so we're like, uh, doo-doo, caca, pee-pee, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and so... <laughs> So we, his car's older, it's a, I don't know, it's like a, it's an old Highlander, I forgot the year, but it's got close to 300,000 miles on it, so we're like, maybe it's just, like, we need to get a new motor, like, we're going, you know, you go through all the things, you're like, ah, oh, dang it, like, so we were praying really hard, and then at the same time, my car crapped out, and it wasn't turning over, and it was just like, oh, dear God, so we prayed really hard, this is just recently, this is like, last week. And so we're like, God, you know, finance is really tight right now, and uh, we can't afford, like, having both. Of Anyways, so we prayed hard. We took Josh's car in, and it turns out the guy was like, because we're like, it's going to cost a couple grand. I got to, I, we need a new motor, whatever. And so the guy's like, you'll never believe this, but there were rats that chewed all the wiring. And we're like, praise God, it was rats. <laughs> we don't need a new. So I feel like God continually <laughs> um, will take rats over, like, having to get a new motor, right? Like, and so, and then my car was an easy fix. It just needed a new battery and stuff. So I just feel like God is constantly, like, and, and, and we serve, like, like, we serve the God of the universe, right? So there's no limits on him. But I think Satan comes along, right? And he wants us to focus on this, this horrible little thing right here, right? And miss out on God's, this is my thing. Have you heard like hurt people hurt people? Well, I think miserable people want to make other people miserable. And Satan's a miserable person, right? So he's like, I'm going to share the wealth, right? 
And I think it's a challenge. That's part of our Christian faith, right? Where God comes along and he's like, I need you to be all in. I need you to be a thousand percent committed. When we started selling the stuff out of our storage, that was like, like symbolically, but also practically, like we were letting go of all of our furniture, all of the stuff that we, you know, not that we like had super nice furniture or anything, but it was just like, we're getting rid of everything that we loved, you know, couch, couches that we, you know, would sit and watch Netflix on during the pandemic and all this stuff, right? We were getting rid of all that. And it was so, I was just like, all right, God, we trust you. We trust you. We trust you. We trust you. And then God comes along, and that for us, that was like our, well, okay, fine, we're doubling down, right? And I feel like God is so faithful that he comes along. He's like, I know what this looks like here. I know what this looks like, but that's not your reality. This is your reality. It's like, so when Sophia was little, but I think when we hold on to stuff, if, if we had tried to push stuff through and, and make things happen on our own, we would have messed up God's plans because he's like, all right, you want to do that, knock yourself out, right? But I have something better in store for you. But I need you committed. I need you to trust me a thousand percent, right? It's like a marriage. If you're always using divorce or being like, ah, I'm, I'm checking out, I, and I understand, right? Like marriage is not for the faint-hearted, amen? Amen, right? Um, if you're always looking like I can go get another another spouse, somebody better, doesn't have the same issues. Well, you're you're taking yourself with you. You're always going to be the main the main common denominator, right? And if you're always functioning like that, you're never going to commit 110% to your marriage. And I feel like God's like, "I need you to trust me 110%. Are you all in?" Okay, so what I want us to do real quick because this is way over the 20 minutes that I was, Josh was like, don't go over. Okay, I want us to turn real quick, and we're going to look at Luke 7. Or sorry, just kidding. Luke will come later. Um, we're going to look at Acts 19, 19 through 20. And um, I don't know if you guys remember, but Pastor um, Michael Jones covered this when we were going through the book of Ephesians, okay? And um, this is background info on Ephesus. Remember, Paul started this church at Ephesus, right? And you remember Ephesus was the home base for what worship? Who? Do you remember? Who? Somebody said Diana. Athena, yes, Artemis also, right? So it was considered, this, this was the epicenter of Artemis worship, okay? There was like sex cult magic stuff wrapped up in it, and this was the epicenter, though, of occultic practices, if you wanted to become a primo wizard, I'm just putting it in our vernacular, um, wizard or witch, you would come to Ephesus and you would learn the occultic ways. And if you were a citizen there, that's just what you grew up with. You know, you served time at the Temple of Athena, right? And you, you did all this stuff, did all this sorcery and magic. So that's just the background, all right? Um, of this. What we're going to do is I want us to read, we're going to read, we're going to turbo read chapter 19. It's not too bad, but all right. So uh, Acts 19, we're going to start at verse 1. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him, we haven't heard uh, that there is a Holy Spirit. Verse 3, then what baptism were you baptized, he asked them. Right, so Paul's trying to get a feel for, okay, how'd you hear about Jesus? How'd you, how'd you, how'd you come about this? Okay, uh, Paul said uh, in verse 4, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak with other languages and to prophesy. Now there were about 12 men in all. Okay, hop down to verse 8. Uh, Then he entered the synagogue and spoke boldly over a period of three months, engaging in discussion and trying to persuade them about the things related to the kingdom of God. But when some became hardened and would not believe, slandering the way in front of the crowd, he withdrew from them and met separately with the disciples, conducting discussions every day. So they're doing Bible studies in a lecture hall of Tyrannus. They think Tyrannus was this wealthy, wealthy Greek dude who was like, sure, come speak in my hall. All right, verse 10. And this went on for two years so that all the inhabitants of the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Okay? All right. Verse 11. God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands, so that even face cloths or work aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Okay, so our next campaign is going to, we're going to be, I can't even do it with a straight face. We're going to be selling holy and blessed handkerchiefs that you can buy, okay? I'm, told, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. How many of you? I grew up on TBN, right? All those Pentecostal. It's like, if you want to buy a blessed hanky, and I was like, why would you? Why in the world would you? No, um, okay, well, this shows, though, the manifestation of the power of God in this town where there is a principality of occultism. And God's like, look at where I'm going to plant my church. Boom. They believe that the church in Ephesus was, and Corinth, so these two things that were in the same area, these two churches were responsible, and of course what Paul did, for the entire spreading of the gospel in that part of the world. That's what our God can do. Amen? That's what we get to be a part of, you guys. All right? Amen. Amen. All right, okay, so uh, okay. So then, so verse 13, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists atten- attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. So this is kind of funny. So, the, um, so okay, sorry, I get distracted and excited. Make a focus. Verse 14. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. The evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know. Okay, so this is a demon talking to these guys that were trying to co-opt the name of Jesus and be like, hey, we're gonna, we'll try the name of Jesus. That seems to work, right? But they weren't true believers, right? So this demon Basically, this is, I, I, this is uh, I think, kind of funny. Okay, so 15. The evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? Okay? Then the man who had the evil spirit leapt on them, overpowered them all. This is horror movie stuff, right? And prevailed against them so that they ran out of that house naked and wounded. All right? So basically, you have these guys that are trying to use the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus, right? But they were trying to be like, hey, look at us. Look what we can do. We got this cool magic trick. And now now at this age, I I hope that we are a church where when we pray or we go to cast out demons, right, or heal the sick or or feed the hungry— if we're in Satan's territory, he's like, oh, I know Jesus and I know you. I want Satan to know my name because I want to bring the fight to him. We are called to be bringers of light, right? Uh, in Corinth, Paul's like, don't hide your light up on a hill, right? And I think especially now with what's going on, all the craziness, right? All the man, they are Freaking aliens left and right, right? Spaceships left and right. Giants walking. All this weird stuff is happening. And sometimes I, I think I don't want to take the fight to Satan. I'm like, I just want to go up in the mountains and live on a homestead with my peeps. <laughs> we'll just live up here off the grid, right? 
And I think Paul knew that that would be our proclivity. Because he's saying, you're going to want to hide your light. You're going to want to go away and hide. But I need you to be the church of Jesus Christ. I need you to be the light bringers. And we can't do that if we've got one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of Christ. Okay? We got to be all in. All in. All right. Let me simmer down. Okay. All right. Let's, Let's finish reading. Okay. Now, this is the freaking cool part because I think... Do you want to talk about being all in? These people, there was a mass conversion, right? This was after two years, so this wasn't just like Paul comes into Ephesus, starts preaching, and boom. This was two years of him travailing, praying, having his life threatened probably every other day. But he didn't give up. He's like, oh, we're bringing, we are, we are on the footstep of Satan's house and we are bringing it to you Satan okay we're and I'm not saying let me just clarify too we are humans we are spiritual beings but on this side of heaven God's like you need to walk under my covering because the demonic forces will eat you for lunch so I just want to I want to put that out there but God does say you are mighty warriors in my name because you are covered in the blood of Jesus okay so I just want to make that point there all right so what happens? I, so I love this because this is the God just moves through this stronghold, this epicenter of occultism, right? And this is what happens. Uh, verse 17, so Acts 19, 17. This became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. Then fear fell on all of them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Verse 18, and many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices. Verse 19, well, many of those who had practiced magic collected their books and burned them in front of everyone. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, So that they calculated their value and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. All right, so what I want us to get here. These people in Ephesus, this was like, this was a generational thing, okay? You didn't just, you weren't like, oh, you get a choice of all these different religions. If you were born in the town of Ephesus, you served Artemis, period. This was a generational thing. How many of you guys come from like, we, you know, fam, we, we've all got like family stuff, right? Like generational stuff where like, you don't deviate from this, Right? Um, so here's kind of a lighthearted example. Um, we, I, I know maybe I look at, don't look at, my sister looks Mexican, but same mom and dad, but, um, so I am half Japanese. And so at all of our meals, we would have white rice for everything, a sticky white rice, right? And so when Josh and I were first married and we would have our family, this was even like up to 10 years ago. He's like, I don't understand you people. So we'd have, like, Thanksgiving dinner, right? We'd have, like, the mashed potatoes and the rolls, right? And the green bean casserole, right? And the turkey and the ham and whatever else, right? But what we also always had was the the white rice. And he's like, why do you have so many starches? Why do you have the white rice? I don't understand it. I said, it's just what, like, it's what we do. Like, you have to have white rice at every meal. That's just what you do. Like, it's expected. And he's like, I don't understand it. You guys are weird. I said, I know. But it's a generational thing. Like, you have to have white rice at every meal, right? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so, same thing here. If you were raised in this culture, it was expected, no questions asked, you served the occult, okay? Okay. And then this happens here, and what I love, it doesn't come across in the English translation, but in verse 9, 19, so uh, Acts 19, 19, it says, um, who practiced magic, collected their books, and burned them in front of everyone. In the Greek, the idea is it's this continual, ongoing fire. So it wasn't just like, they're like, we're going to set aside today, Sunday, between two and four, and you bring all your magic, cult stuff, and we'll burn it. 
This was like a bonfire that went on for days, maybe even weeks. Because as people started getting convicted, if it didn't hit the first time and take the first time, they were like, you know what? I want to serve Jesus. I am all in. I'm burning all my stuff that linked me with my past identity. Because I am a new creation in Jesus. Amen? So they burned that. They're like, and they, there's been estimates of how much was burned here, right? They, they don't know the exact amount, but it was, it was a crap ton of money. And some people are like, well, they could have taken that and resold it somewhere and raised money for the poor. But it's this idea, this, this sacrifice to God. It's a heart, it's a posture of the heart. Where you're like, Jesus, I love you so much. I am willing to give you everything, 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 and I lay it at your feet. That's what this new giving thing is about. That we are so in love with Jesus and so captivated. You guys, they changed the economy. The new Christians here in Ephesus, because you read later on, there's like a silversmith. It's like, nobody's buying my, my little trinkets and my idols anymore. This is jacking up the economy. And they were going to assassinate Paul and all the believers that did this. So they're like, you guys messed up our economy. How awesome would it be if we got so convicted that we were like, we're changing the economy. We're changing the economy. Well, guess what? We get to do that here in Claremont. We are the light of the world. Our small little family church is the light of the world. When we do living nativity, how many of you guys have been to nativity? Anybody? Okay, so a lot of us here. I love it. Like, there was this one guy last year that came through, and here I am on my stupid little, I'm still on an e-scooter, and it's so creaky, right? So I'm going through the back of the show, and it's all, ree, ree, ree. but I was trying to talk to guests as they came out to see how, how their experience was, and this one guy made me poop my pants secretly. He was tall guy, six, like probably like six 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 seven. He was a big guy, tatted, just tatted everywhere, lots of tats. And he just he looked like a gangbanger. I was like, I'm gonna be very nice to this man. He comes out, but he's crying, and I'm like, oh whoa. I said, are you okay? He's like, uh uh. And I was like, oh I'm sorry. I'm like, but do, are you okay? He's like, I this show wrecked me. He's like, this wrecked me. And I just love that we get to have that impact here. Our little church, like we, we are known for doing that. And it's not like we put on this great show. That's not, but that people get touched by God. They have encounters with God through our drama here. And I just think that's a neat thing. All right. Um, now, just real quick, so you guys aren't like, well, Mako's making a big deal of the occult stuff. I'm just going to read a few verses to you guys real quick about how serious God is. And I, what I want you to get is that these, because the people at Ephesus committed wholeheartedly, they weren't like, I'm going to keep one little idol, or I'm going to keep one little magic book, or one little trinket, or one necklace. They burned it all for Jesus. And because of that... They changed the culture. They changed the economy. And I just think that's amazing. And I think, honestly, um, you know, Josh and I, don't, we're not into sheep beating. We don't like, but I feel like the church has fallen asleep, and I want us to wake up because we are called to be salt and light. Salt, back in this, this time, you know, the, how many of you guys have heard the, the saying, um, this person's not worth their salt? It's because Roman soldiers, salt was so valuable back in the day that people would get paid in salt. Because salt could be used to clean wounds. It could be used to preserve food. It was used for seasoning. There was something in the Old Testament called a salt covenant. If you, so they would bake the bread, right? You have somebody in your tent and you put salt on it and you would eat that bread. When you did that, you were making an unbreakable covenant with this person. You're like, to death do us part. It wasn't just for married people, but it was. That's why communion is so important, because we are making an oath before God. All right. I just want to read some verses to you, though, real quick. So 
like Mako's blowing this out of proportion. I'm not. Leviticus 19.31. These verses are not going to be up on the, the thing, the screen. But do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritualists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Uh, Leviticus 26. I will set my face against anyone who turns to mediums and spiritists to prostitute themselves. That's a strong word. Um, Prostitute themselves by following them, and I will cut them off from their people. Revelation 21.8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immortal, immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Um, and I'll read one more here. This is Deuteronomy 18.10. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium or, or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. All right, so you get the idea here. God's like, do not touch. It's not like a gray area. God's like, you touch this, these are the consequences. And yet the church, because they were 100% all in in Ephesus, they burned their past life. God was able to take that and change the world because of it. All right? All right. So I was going to read Luke 7, 36 through 50 real quick. Let's just pull that up on the screen. I promise I won't preach an entire sermon on that. But what I want you guys to do is let's look at Luke 7, 36 through 50. Okay, so Jesus is having dinner. This is the, the context. He's having dinner um, at this Pharisee's house, right? And typically in that day, you, if you had somebody in your home, you had the servants wash their feet because you wear sandals, and it's the Mideast. Your feet are going to get caked on dirt and nastiness. So you washed somebody's feet. Aren't you? I'm... <laughs> Which is, I'm glad we don't do that nowadays. I'm just saying, like, um, okay. So Jesus is eating dinner in this Pharisee's home, and this woman busts in the home and is like, she comes in. She is a prostitute. That's the, it doesn't say it out like, right? But that's, that's, that's the vibe that we get, right? And she comes in to wash Jesus' feet. All right. Let's look at uh, Luke 7, 36. Then one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Verse 37. And a woman in the town who was a sinner, a.k.a. prostitute, found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood behind him at his feet, weeping and began to wash his feet with her, her tears. She wiped his feet with the hair of her head, kissing them and anointing them with a fragrant oil. All right, then the story goes on, and, you know, the Pharisees, like, which, uh, let's be honest, like, if we were eating somewhere, right, and somebody else busted in and was, like, start touching your feet, that would be a little weird, right? I'm just going to, that, that would be odd. But what this woman does is she, so the alabaster jar, that was her retirement fund, is what that was. That was her, as a prostitute, there was no 401k, you know, there was no, there was no retirement plan. This was her retirement plan, was this alabaster flask, okay, because she could sell it somewhere and get a crap ton of money for it. And what she does is what we see the Ephesians doing. And I want us to get this idea that there's, 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 there's finances connected to both accounts, and so what she does is she comes in and she breaks this alabaster, this tiny jar she's wearing around her neck that's worth a crap ton of money. It's her retirement fund. She doesn't put out a drop or two. She dumps the entire thing at the feet of Jesus. She's all in. All in. What she is doing is like the Ephesians did when they burn all their crap. She is saying, I am stepping over completely. I'm completely serving Jesus. I am dedicating. She, she got rid of her. And I'm not saying you go home and you empty out your bank account unless God tells you. But I'm just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just, it's this, it's a, because you can give all your money 
but have a prideful heart or be like, God, ah, and being grumbly. That's not what God wants. The whole idea of the giving thing and what we see with this woman and what happens in Ephesians or in Acts with the, 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 the converted occultists is that they are so captivated by Jesus and the kingdom of heaven that they're gladly, they're like, I give it all to serve Jesus, all of it to serve Jesus. And so, can I have the band come up, please? I just think that we could think of it like this, right? I think God uses our finances as a litmus test for our, our heart. Because, um, let's see, Matthew twenty or 621, this is the Passion, Passion Translation, it says, for your heart will always pursue what you esteem as treasure. And I just think that what are we investing in, right? And I, I just, what I want you guys to do is as we are doing communion, I want us to get out our, our communion things, and just think about, and if you're not comfortable with doing communion right now, it's fine. Raise your hand, though, if you would like to do communion, and the ushers can come by and give you one. Remember what I talked about briefly, the salt, the idea of the salt covenant? Here's the deal. Jesus was like, I beat you guys, this blows my mind. I, I did stupid things in college. So many stupid things. I should have died. I was stupid, stupid, stupid. And God knew before I was even born, he's like, I will, I'll take Mako as mine. While we were yet sinners, Jesus looks at us and says, I want, these are mine, these are my people. And I think it's an unbreakable covenant. There's nothing you can do that God will be like, no, I'm out, deuces. You're not mine anymore. He's like, I made a salt covenant with you. And we broke bread over it. You're mine. And so right now, I just want us to go ahead and just take a second to sit. Sit still before God. Whether you're in a great place and you're like, God, I know that I am yours. I know that I belong to you. Or maybe you're like, God, I think I belong to you, but I don't feel it. I pray right now for the Holy Spirit just to fall on us in the name of Jesus. And I pray for a breaking off of the orphan spirit in the name of Jesus. I pray that every person in here would know that they belong to Jesus and that Jesus loves them and that God the Father loves them so abundantly. So God, right now, we come before you. We thank you that you first loved us, God. And so we break this bread with you, God, and we say thank you for the gift of eternal life. Thank you for, for you saying you are the original all in. You said, I love you. I claim you. You're mine. So, Lord, with thankfulness, we take communion. Eat the bread. And then we know that there is power in the blood. Westerners, that's kind of weird for us, right? We're like, ooh, blood. But there is power in the blood of Jesus. It's not witchcraft. It's not weird stuff. Like, he spilt his blood to redeem us. And so, Lord Jesus, we drink this cup humbly. We thank you for the blood that you spilt, Lord. Thank you that you saw value in us when we were doing stupid stuff, when we did not realize how valuable we were, God. Drink now the blood of Christ. I want you guys to take this. If you feel like today you could feel this, fill this out and you're comfortable with that, do it. But I'm also gonna more heavily encourage you guys, take this home and pray over it and see what you can commit to. And I know... You know, it's like, oh, financiers in the church, it's so weird. But we are trying to be better stewards. And to do that, we need to know how much money we have coming in so we can pay our bills, pay our staff. 
very practically what we're looking at right now is everybody's going to go to part-time. Everybody's already got second jobs, but everybody would have to go to part-time. We don't want to do that because we've got counseling appointments to do. We've got people to go visit in hospitals. And when you tithe, you enable us to do that as pastors here. All right? So I want you guys just to take your cards. Um, if you're already giving a set amount, that's fine. Just put it on here so we know what we can count on for for the year. And if you're, like, not comfortable with this, that's fine. Or if you want to talk to somebody on the pastoral staff and be like, uh, this hits me wrong, whatever, that's fine. We're open to that, too. God says he loves a cheerful giver, right? So I don't want anybody being, like, feeling like they're coerced or they're being pushed into this. Um, let's go ahead. Why don't we start the baskets then? Um, and I want to read this, this uh, but on a very practical level, though, too, you guys, like, what are we investing in? Do we have that passion like that guy that sold his house to get Super Bowl tickets? That's just like, a, that's like next level. Like, that's wow, wow. But the church is the hope of the world. We really are, and that's not like a boastful, like, Jesus is like, no, I need you here. I need you to be my arms and my feet. Every Saturday, but it's not just Saturday for the food bank. It's throughout the week. I just, Gary and Sylvia, thank you so much for your serving, and the Robles is too. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Um, every basket of food that's given out, every, 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 every box of food is giving hope. When we do our living nativity and we've got, we'll call him Brutus, right? This tatted up, hard looking gang member dude that's touched by the message of the gospel. That's what we are here to do. And we need everybody to commit. We're a small church, but we are freaking mighty. Amen? All right, let me, let me read this to you. This is Proverbs 11.25. This is from Pastor, Pastor Jeannie who did this verse in our, in our huddle. Um, it says, those who live to bless others will have blessings heaped on them. And the one who pours out his life to pour out blessings will be saturated with favor. We cannot outgive God. And it, once again, it's not a pay to play. It's saying, God, I love you so much that I am going to break that alabaster, that security, and I'm going to give that to you. We can't outgive God. It's not like he's a poor God and he's like, oh, I need the money. It's to teach us stuff. And also practically to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. So I want you just to take this home, pray about it, think on it, all right? You got to pay your electric bill, feed your kids, pay for prescriptions and all that stuff. But I just want to send you out with this kingdom principle. When you invest in the kingdom of heaven, you cannot outgive God. God's like, I'm going to take you from living in a trailer where you're <laughs> pumping out your own poop into the sewer line. I'm going to give you a beautiful home that you can rest in. That's the God that we serve, okay? All right, let me send you out with a blessing. Lord Jesus, I pray that every person here would be blessed and filled knowing that they are a son and daughter of the Most High King. Lord, I pray for divine encounters this entire week, that they would know that you are walking right beside them, Lord Jesus. God, we love you. Use us. We say, here we are. Send us, Lord Jesus. Let us be a bright light here in this area, Lord God. I pray that every person for, for divine encounters, Lord, that you would give every person here an opportunity to shine the light of Jesus, Lord, at their local Starbucks, when they go do grocery shopping, when they're picking up their kids at work, whatever, Lord, in their cubicle. But you would give every person here an opportunity this week to be the light of Jesus. We love you so much. Thank you for first loving us, Lord. We bless you in your name. Amen. All right, you guys, go with God. Have a great week. Thank you, guys. You guys are awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.